salt, please? Sure. Thanks. Does this scene look familiar to you? Of course it does. We all add salt to our food and sugar to our drinks every day. In this lesson, we will start to use what we have learned about physical and chemical change so far as we focus on ordinary, everyday changes that we make to our food to change its taste. We will explore the changes that take place when we make salt and sugar solutions and we will find that it is not only taste that changes when we add salt or sugar to our food. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the macroscopic changes that take place when we add salt to water and sugar to water, interpret these changes at a microscopic level, classify these changes as physical or chemical changes, and apply these ideas to other solutions. The soup in the bowl and the tea in the mug are not pure substances. They are both mixtures of many different things. Together, these many different substances give soup and tea their characteristic tastes. But both soup and tea are mainly made up of water. So instead of using soup and tea, let's just add salt and sugar to water. When we change water by adding salt or sugar to it, we are making solutions. What we want to find out is how the properties of salt and sugar change when we mix them with water. To do this, we must first examine some of the properties of pure salt, pure sugar and pure water. Then we can add each solid to water and examine the properties of the two solutions, a salt solution and a sugar solution. An easy way to collect all the data from our investigations is to collate it in a table. There are two macroscopic properties we will examine, so they must go onto the table. These two properties are the appearance of the substance and whether or not it conducts electricity. Before we start our investigation, let's do what chemists do. Let's translate the common names of the substances into the chemical formula of each of the substances. The table salt that we use to change the taste of our food is mostly sodium chloride, NaCl. Sugar that we use to change the taste of tea is cane sugar or sucrose, C12H22O11. Water is of course H2O. A salt solution is a sodium chloride solution and a sugar solution is a sucrose solution. We use the abbreviation AQ for aqueous from the Latin word aqua, which means water, to tell us that the sodium chloride and the sucrose are dissolved in water. Okay. Let's have a careful look at the salt and the sugar. Do you see that both these solids are finely divided rather than being one single piece? Do you notice that all the grains of salt have pretty much the same shape and so do all the grains of sugar? This is amazing. We call these grains crystals. The salt and sugar are both white solids. Now we all know what water looks like, so we can fill in colorless liquid on our table. These crystals that we have just seen tell us a great deal about the structure of the salt and the sugar. The fact that these crystals all have the same shape tells us that these particles are arranged in a regular and stable way. Each grain of sodium chloride is made up of sodium ions and exactly the same number of chloride ions. Inside the crystal, strong electrostatic forces of attraction hold the positive sodium ions and the negative chloride ions in fixed positions in the lattice. This type of chemical bond formed between ions is called an ionic bond. But what about the sucrose particles? Do you think they are also regularly arranged? They must be, mustn't they? Because all of the sugar crystals have the same shape. But this time the particles in the lattice are all identical sucrose molecules. This drawing represents one sucrose molecule. Each sucrose molecule is made up of 12 carbon atoms, 22 hydrogen atoms and 11 oxygen atoms. Even though each molecule is made of 45 different atoms, it is much too small for us to see. Chemical bonds Intramolecular forces hold these 45 atoms together to form one molecule. 
The chemical bonds formed between atoms are called covalent bonds. A sucrose crystal is made of many, many of these identical molecules packed together in a very regular way like this. Of course, something must hold these sugar molecules together, otherwise they would not stay in position. It is intermolecular forces that hold the molecules in position in the crystal. Now, let's find out if these pure substances conduct electricity or not. We use an electric circuit to do this. Let's start by recapping how the circuit works. The source of energy in the circuit is a battery. This bulb tells us about the current in the circuit. These two pencil LEDs are made of graphite, an electrical conductor. At the moment, the circuit is open. See, there's only air between the two pencil LEDs. This air is not an electrical conductor, so the bulb does not light up. But watch what happens when I join the two pencil LEDs with copper wire. The bulb lights brightly. This tells us that charge can move in the copper wire. It is an electrical conductor. In metals and graphite, this moving charge is moving electrons. Now we are ready to use the circuit to find out if salt, sugar and water conduct electricity. Remember to record your observations while you are watching this investigation. Let's start with the salt crystal. Does the bulb light? Is sodium chloride an electrical conductor? Now let's test a sugar crystal. Do you think the bulb will light if we put the leads in water? Let's see. The bulb doesn't light when we join the two pencil leads with salt, with sugar or with water. None of these pure substances conduct enough electricity to light the bulb. What does this observation tell us about these substances? Well, it tells us that there is no movement of charge in the salt, the sugar or in the water. So, now it is time for us to add some flavour to our water. Do you see what happens to the salt when I stir? It seems to disappear. But of course, we know that matter doesn't disappear. The salt must have spread into the water. It must divide into tiny pieces, pieces too small to see when I put it into the water. We call this spreading and mixing of a solid in a liquid dissolving. Dissolving changes the appearance of the salt, doesn't it? But the water looks the same. Let's now test to see if this mixture, the solution, conducts electricity. Look at the bulb now. It lights very brightly. Before I add these observations to the table, let's first have a look at what happens when we sweeten things a little. When I stir sugar into the water, it also seems to disappear, but of course it must be in the water. The sugar also breaks into pieces, too tiny to see when it dissolves in the water. Do you think that this sugar solution will conduct electricity? Well, does the bulb light up? No, it doesn't. I'm sure you'll agree that dissolving changes other things besides taste, doesn't it? Dissolving changes the appearance of the salt and the sugar, but not the appearance of the water. Dissolving salt changes the conductivity of the water, but dissolving sugar does not change the conductivity of the water. The fact that a salt solution conducts electricity tells us that charge is moving through the solution. Let's see if we can work out a microscopic explanation to see why this happens. Let's look at our model of one of the ionic salt crystals again. Any ion in the middle of the crystal is surrounded by other ions on all sides. Above it, below it, behind it and in front of it are other atoms pulling it equally in all directions by exerting electrostatic forces on it. These electrostatic forces, or chemical bonds, keep the ions in position and prevents them from moving. Ions on the surface of the crystal, however, are not so lucky. The electrostatic forces holding them in its place are not balanced. 
and the water molecules, as you may remember, are polar molecules. So when fast-moving polar water molecules collide into the positive and negative ions of the salt crystal, they may exert a stronger electrostatic force on these ions than the ions on their other sides. This breaks the chemical bond and pulls ions off the crystal into the water. The salt crystal then becomes smaller and smaller as each atom is pulled into the water. Eventually, it becomes too small for us to see. That's when we think the salt disappears. Once the atoms are pulled out of the solid, they become surrounded on all sides by a sheath of water molecules. And of course, these ions, which we call hydrated ions, are now free to move and conduct charge. That's how ionic salts may dissolve in water to form good electrical conductors. We can represent this whole process of dissolving by an equation. NaCl brackets S plus H2O become Na positive brackets AQ plus Cl minus brackets AQ. Does this reaction represent a physical or chemical change? I think you can see by looking at the equation that hydrated ions were formed in this process. Water molecules have pulled the ions present in the solid away from each other. So the ionic bonds holding the ions in the lattice have been broken and new forces of attraction between the ions and the water molecules have formed. So this must be a chemical process. Let's now take a look at what happens when we dissolve sugar. Watch how the sugar crystal gets smaller and smaller in size as sugar molecules are pulled out of the crystal by water molecules. While you watch, perhaps you can decide whether the sugar molecules broke into smaller, simpler molecules while they were dissolving. No, the molecules remain the same shape. The intramolecular forces inside each molecule have not changed. All that happens is that the same molecules are rearranged. Instead of being regularly arranged, as in the crystal, each is now surrounded by water molecules. This tells us that only the intermolecular forces have been broken during the dissolving process. And so, this represents a physical change. The sugar molecules in the water are still electrically neutral and so do not conduct electricity. Once again, we can use an equation to represent this dissolving of sucrose. On that note, here is your task for today. People used honey long before they used sugar to sweeten food. One of the sugars in honey is fructose, C6H12O6. People with heart disease use potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride to season their food. Potassium chloride, KCl, is a crystal held together by ionic bonds. For each substance described in 1 and 2, write an equation to represent it dissolving in water and decide if each change is a physical or chemical change. Today, we have seen that the simple act of changing the taste of our food involves amazing activity at a molecular level. Countless bonds break and countless bonds form. This bond breaking and bond formation involves energy transfer that we will investigate more fully in the next lesson. Goodbye.